Hi, everyone. I'll just take a minute while people get in, get tech settled and all logged on. Thank you all for joining us. While you're just getting settled, I'll run through the standard housekeeping. Um, so just so you're aware, we can't see any, any, um, any attendees. You're not visible on this side of the panel, uh, so you won't be able to speak to us. But you can ask questions. Uh, we'd really love it if you did. This is about evidence gathering. This is about exploring some of these issues. So do feel free to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and submit those at any point. I'll, I'll keep an eye on them and put them to the speakers as we get a moment. Our handle is also at Ada Lovelace Inst. If you want to tweet there, I'll keep an eye on that as well. And if you would like captions, we've got a live, um, we've got a transcriber with us who's doing live closed captions as well. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a button if you want to press that to get that function as well. Finally, we're recording this. It will be up on our website later um, and it's part of a series. And I think it uh, looks like most people are now with us. So I'll start the event properly and uh, just welcome you all to today's public evidence event on the science, the epidemiology and the economic economics of vaccine passports and health status apps. My name is Imogen Parker um, and I'm Head of Policy at the Ada Lovelace Institute. For those of you that don't know us, we're a research and deliberation institute based in the UK. We've got the remit to ensure that data and AI work for people and society. And this is the second public event of a series that we're holding, uh, really rapidly trying to explore the evidence and to profile different disciplinary or sectoral perspectives that we think you really need when it comes to assessing whether or how you might use a vaccine passports or COVID status apps. Last week's event, which is on Thursday and is still available on our website, we looked at the history of vaccine passports around kind of smallpox, looked at international regulations and work underway to develop open technical standards by COVID credentials and Linux Foundation. And we also heard from one of the companies has been have been developing an app and are currently piloting it in the UK with different um, uh, health and care bodies. Um, that was only five days ago, but since that event, um, there's been a lot more developments in this area. It's such a rapid, <laughs> such a kind of rapid evolution. So two announcements I just thought worth mentioning and I think worth us collectively keeping an eye on. One is that Australia have announced that their Australian immunization register is gonna provide the basis of a COVID vaccine, COVID vaccine certificate, but they'll be leaving it up to states and territories to make decisions about how it might be used for travel or to access work or to access social spaces. So I think that's something to keep an eye on. And yesterday, Greece and Israel, Greece have been um, very vocal about the case for a vaccine passport. And yesterday, Greece and Israel signed a deal to use green passports that will allow people who've been vaccinated against coronavirus to move freely between those countries once travel restarts. And that's without any limitations or requirements about self-isolation. So I think that's really, that will be a really interesting study to watch. And um, off the back of Greece advocating for that over the weekend, I think there was a flurry of interest in the UK context about how the UK might respond to that um, and I think on Saturday the vaccines minister made a very clear statement that at present the UK government would not be developing a vaccine passport scheme although people would be able to get certificates from their GP if required and two of the reasons that he gave were that we currently don't know enough about transmission and that it would be discriminatory harmful to some groups above others and those two points I think really nicely set up today's session and I hope we're going to have a chance to explore those two factors on where the evidence is on those points. So that brings us really nicely to today's event. Um, the, the framing for this really is that the, the sort of measures we've seen in trying to manage the pandemic, things like lockdowns and, and border closures, have often been framed in terms of striking a balance between protecting people's health and protecting the economy. And I don't want to fall into the trap of seeing those two things as binary and in opposition to each other. But given the real risk to health and, and life posed by COVID and the huge damage we've seen done to the UK economy, done to global economies um, in the past year, I think it's really important we examine 
any rationale for the introduction of a vaccine passport with an understanding of how it might affect public health, how it might interact with other health strategies and how it might affect the economy. So I am really delighted and really grateful to be joined by three experts to help us think that through. We've got Ruth Payne, who is academic clinical lecturer and honorary special registrar in infectious diseases and microbiology at the University of Sheffield. We've got Mark Jitt, who's Professor of Vaccine Epidemiology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And we've got Linda Yu, who is Professor, um, who is Fellow in Economics at the University of Oxford, Adjunct Professor of Economics at the London Business School and Visiting Professor at the LSE. Thank you all for joining us today. And I want to start with Linda, who is kindly joining us, even though she's about to move to another event at quarter two to launch launch a big programme of her own work. So I want to, to start with her, make sure we have enough time to think about the economy. And I wonder, Linda, if we could start with some opening remarks about what we know about the economic impacts of opening some parts of society or travel based on vaccination status or how we might start to understand or measure the impacts of that. Let me turn to you. Thanks very much. Um, and it's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, I know it's um, this, uh, this is a great series you're doing in terms of call for evidence, um, looking at both science and economics. And I always think um, because of uh, scheduling, it's, it's unusual for The Economist to go first. So I'm just going to be brief and maybe outline uh, some of the issues and hope that the scientists, um, you know, uh, fill in all the key, <laughs> key things that um, economists are reacting to. Um, and this is indeed um, what um, the, I think, the interaction is, um, that this pandemic has resulted in a need to control the virus and indeed live with the virus and the economic policies have come on the back of that, um, how to support it, how to address it. Um, and indeed, if you look at um, the business cycle, the kind of the, uh, the increases and decreases of national output, it pretty closely tracks uh, periods of lockdown and restrictions. And so therefore, like I said, <laughs> for the economists to go first, it's a little bit bold. So I'm going to be <laughs> just going to be brief and lay out some of the issues um, and maybe some of the evidence of what we've already um, gleaned from about a year. Can't believe it's about a year of, uh, of this uh, pandemic um, already. So the first thing is um, the economic evidence um, roughly shows that about half of the economic impact, so that's the restrictions in terms of activities, that comes from uh, the lockdown measures. Um, so, um, you know, not being able to uh, leave your home except for your one exercise per day, um, those kinds of measures. But the other half is actually behavioral. So the Bank of England have done some work on this. And because there's, um, there's worries about uh, and uncertainty about what the virus is, about transmission, about all of those things dampen economic activity. And so bearing that in mind, behavior um, is a very key component to understanding uh, any measures which are introduced uh, on the health side, as well as the economic side. And I think that's probably uh, one um, issue to probe in terms of uh, vaccine uh, passports, which is perhaps a look at the evidence of other type measures like track and trace um, or other countries like Singapore, which have implemented it more strictly in terms of the effect on behavior. Um, and that will help determine whether or not there's a distributional uh, impact. In other words, you know, does it do what um, does having um, some type of uh, indicator, um, which really just picks up, um, you know, having had uh, negative test results, you know, what is the micro evidence um, around that? Is that enough, uh, given the concerns about asymptomatic transmission, mutant variants, imperfect uh, protection from vaccines, is that sufficient to really have a different economic impact. And of course, I'm looking at the scientists, there's tons more issues, including uh, take up of these track and trace systems and various things. But I would say um, that's probably one thing uh, to stress. The other thing, obviously, to stress is, um, you know, this pandemic is global. So you've mentioned there um, other countries which are requiring this, which is why we have to respond. And uh, the current policy of uh, getting um, a, a note, you know, from your GP, I mean, that is in addition to 
the requirements which are coming in, I believe, from uh, later on this week about having not just a negative test result to enter the UK for uh, certain countries, but also having two um, negative COVID tests before you uh, could leave self-isolation and quarantine. So there's already quite a lot of um, uh, restrictions um, in terms of activities um, on the basis of having negative tests. So I think that's that's already in the works. And obviously, um, you know, the economic impact um, on certain sectors like transport and hospitality um, is significant. It's one of the reasons why um, we should be led by the science um, and understanding which sectors um, will be affected, even with uh, these new policies, uh, uh, you know, with new policies coming in, the distribution impact will change. Um, but I think the overall macro view is still that the travel, hospitality, leisure sectors, basically any gatherings um, where you have people um, in, a, in, a, uh, in an enclosed space, um, they're going to be affected. And how do we live with the virus? And that's where economic policy can play a role, um, not just uh, in the areas that we're describing in terms of restrictions, but in terms of support. So it'd be very important as we look at um, the, you know, uh, over the course of this year and in the coming years is how do you ensure that the sectors which will be impacted probably for some time because, um, you know, there's no, uh, there's a lot of uncertainty here. Um, do they have cash flow that can be supported? Um, are they able to deploy capital and workers sufficiently? So in other words, um, are you supporting them to adjust to living with the virus? Um, what kind of fiscal measures should be put in there to help upgrade and upskill um, employers and give them incentives to keep people attached to work? Um, the self-employed, is there income support if they're working in these sectors to enable us not to have a permanent negative growth impact from this pandemic. And that is dependent, highly dependent on people, people attached to the workforce and viable businesses afloat. Um, and those things, plus, um, you know, investing, um, if you're going to borrow all this money, you should invest to grow. So greening the economy, raising productivity, um, upgrading infrastructure, including digital, these are all things um, that can help a more efficient adjustment um, of the economy. And that's a longer term uh, macro um, aim that I think should be stressed. So I'm going to pause there. And um, as I said, I've flagged a lot of issues that the scientists will be better able to, uh, to comment on. But I think the economics has to support um, and follow uh, what the science uh, uh, you know, says. Thank you so much, Linda. I know just because you have to you might have to drop off early. I'm just going to ask a follow up question now before we move on to the other speakers. And um, well, there's a couple of follow up questions I'd love to ask. One, one you mentioned um, how important this is to think about behavioural economics, and I wondered how hard that is in this period of a pandemic to predict in advance whether or not we're seeing very unexpected things, or whether or not we can look to other countries or to look at historic data and feel we can play that forward or we're just in very unusual times so that was one question and then the other question I just wanted to probe a bit more was how if we were to open up parts of travel or parts of society to those who have been vaccinated just whether you have any thoughts about the impacts that might have around equality or inequality or whether um, you know, either at a domestic level or thinking globally as well. Just um, a couple more probes on the kind of economics front before you have to leave us, if that's okay. Of course. Um, so, I mean, just thinking about how uh, vaccinations are being done uh, here versus different countries, they're being done in different ways. So here, um, the, uh, the most vulnerable populations are being vaccinated first. Um, that's not always the case in other countries. So, for instance, in the United States, they, different states have different policies and the priorities sometimes are around frontline workers. That's already an element of um, difference um, in terms of who, who would be um, given these passports or certificates. And that also has an impact, obviously, on, um, on uh, you know, uh, on just, uh, you know, thinking about this issue. And the reason it's good you mentioned international comparisons is obviously 
um, you know, the pandemic knows no borders. So, you know, whatever it is that we're doing um, here, we have to keep an eye on, on what, what is happening um, elsewhere. Um, in terms of um, thinking about can we, behavioral economics, um, you know, is hard during a time of uncertainty. Um, it's probably hard normally anyways to, uh, to, to try and work out our human behavior. Um, but, you know, I've written a book on economic history. Um, I looked at about 250 years and it covers the Spanish flu in the early part of the 20th century. So there are lessons we can learn from previous um, pandemics. Um, not all of them have been global, obviously, they have been regional ones as well. So there is evidence you can pick up, especially around uh, people's uh, behavior. Um, and just thinking about the Spanish flu, I know you mentioned you looked at it um, before, um, you know, came in three, uh, four waves for some countries. And even with the advances and the speed of vaccines that we've seen now, Hong Kong has just gone into its fourth lockdown um, around um, COVID. So I think there's quite a few behavioral, um, you know, evidence that you can draw from what, uh, you know, what uh, just even the posture across countries, uh, what we can learn from it. And the evidence that I gave you is roughly the Bank of England looking at, you know, the evidence for the UK and saying, actually, you know, we shouldn't think of it as a, you know, as a trade-off, we should think of it as um, economics, um, you know, following the science and recognizing behavior plays a big role in what's going to happen to economic um, activity. So, so absolutely, look to other countries, look for, you know, historical evidence. Um, most of all, you know, let's, um, let's, uh, you know, follow the science. <laughs> Looking forward to the scientists telling us um, how we're going to live with the virus. Well, <laughs> so thank you. Thanks, Linda. That's a really fantastic contribution and perfectly tease us up now to move to the other side of this. Um, so I wanted to turn to Ruth first. Um, if you can just help us, help the audience understand where we are in terms of current understanding on efficacy of different vaccines. And I think really importantly, this question about transmission, because it does feel that the cornerstone to the idea of a passport that would let you do certain things is really about the risk you're posing to other people. It's really about that transmission risk. And it feels like evidence is, is emerging every day, but it would just be great to better understand this from the scientific perspective. So let me hand over to you now. Uh, thanks Imogen and thanks for the invitation to talk on this very interesting and fast moving um, item really. Um, I think it's fair to say that we're all pretty desperate to get back to a more normal way of living um, and the development of effective vaccines is, is going to be key to, in that. Um, and it's really wonderful that within a year we've got multiple vaccines that show high efficacy um, in their initial analyses um, and that we've got a vaccination programme within the NHS that's progressing so successfully. So there's been some really good news stories um, out of the last year. But that being said, I think it's really important that we recognise the limitations um, of the information that we have and that we proceed with caution, uh, learning lessons from the recent and the more distant past, um, as has been alluded to by Linda. Um, and I think there are really key issues to think about in relation to this, in, in, in relation to the development and, um, and use of a vaccine passport for COVID-19, um, particularly given that we're at this early stage. Um, so the first thing to mention is obviously that, yes, we've got vaccine trials that have published really high efficacies and we've seen good immune responses um, produced by those vaccines, but they've come from clinical trials. Uh, where we screen participants um, and we enrol participants from certain groups of the population, um, so adults um, in all of the trials so far, um, and we've selected them out to not have extreme comorbidities or uncontrolled um, long-term chronic illnesses or severe immunosuppression um, or even you know, fairly mild immunosuppression in some cases. Um, so we don't know how the vaccine will work in a real population um, in terms of the efficacy. Um, and although those, the, the, uh, those processes are vital for, for vaccine development and it's the right thing to do in those kind of phase trials, we don't actually know what the efficacy will be in a real population until we start rolling it out um, and gather that, that data um, from, from vaccine rollout programmes as is happening in the UK now. Um, and 
we also know that you know clinical trials rely on people participating voluntarily so um, being willing to enroll in, in in those vaccination trials um, and that means that the population within a, a clinical trial may not be reflective of the population within your country um, or certainly globally um, either in terms of ethnicity or in terms of scales of deprivation or, or other factors that are different within our populations and so we have to think about those other factors that may influence the immunology behind the vaccine and how people respond to the vaccine, the efficacy because uh, because of how um, both from an immunological and behavioural point of view that may um, that may impact that. Um, and the other thing to say is that the the data we have so far um, is is kind of. Um, bias towards the younger population in terms of efficacy because of how the, the vaccine trials were conducted. And um, so uh, as is often the case, younger adults were enrolled first and then um, particularly with the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, it, it wasn't until later on that the older adults were, uh, were enrolled into the study. And so we've got longer term data and more detailed data on younger uh, adults in terms of the efficacy and, 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 and less within the older population. Um, and rightly so we're now vaccinating the older more vulnerable population but it means that we're not going to have that same level of immunological detail um, that we do for the younger population because we they're understandably now being unblinded from the clinical trials if they were taking part to go and um, take part in, and have a have a vaccination if they were in the placebo arms um, and and so we're really reliant on the the epidemiological efficacy that we're going to see over time um, rather than having that same kind of detailed immunological response. And from an immunological point of view, we know that different individuals make different responses, uh, whether it's to infection or to vaccination. Um, so some people make a really effective immune response, um, have really um, good antibody response with um, antibodies that um, prevent them from getting sick and also prevent them from passing on the virus to somebody else, um, whether that's to infection or to vaccination. Um, uh, and, and, you know, we also know that obviously T cells are really important in, the, in a vaccine response as well, um, as well as, as to an infection response. Um, and they also, the, the kind of amount of antibody produced, the quality of the antibody produced, um, the, and the quality and quantity of T cells produced varies into individually and and I say that's the same whether it's a vaccination or an inf a natural infection um, and we don't yet know exactly what level of those responses is going to be necessary to say that someone's protected or not and to say whether they're protected um, in, in what we call sterilizing immunity where they're completely protected from infection and can't pass on the disease to anybody else or a protective immunity where they may be protected from severe disease themselves um, and uh, but they, they may still become asymptomatically or subclinically infected and therefore may be able to transmit the, the virus to others uh, and certainly we've got much more limited data in terms of asymptomatic infection in, in the clinical trials um, with but, but data enough to show that it certainly doesn't prevent all asymptomatic infections um, where, where that has been looked at for, so in particular with the, the Oxford AstraZeneca um, vaccine trial. Um, so there's lots of research obviously going into looking into what what are the, the what we call the correlates of protection and um, you know what is it what does it mean to have an effective immune response how do we measure that um and and you know and, and it's really really vital to know that um but at the moment we're we're in the kind of early days of that we don't know um how long protection lasts after vaccination we're obviously you know uh, we've only been living with this virus for just over a year so um we certainly don't know whether that that protection is going to last um how long and whether we're going to need annual vaccinations like we do for for influenza for example um, because of changes in the um, in the virus or because of um, a reduction in immunity and um, we know that immune responses wane over time to infections um, a lot in, in a lot of cases. So I think um, there are lots of good stories to take from the clinical trials um, and I think in particular uh, all of them seem to have been effective in reducing severe disease which is really important in terms of protecting people from from death from Covid and also from protecting our healthcare systems from being overwhelmed um, but there are lots of um, other unanswered questions and those will become clearer over time as we follow people up and as we get um, more data. Um, and uh, the other key thing to mention, I think, which has also been in the news a lot this week, is about the difference in variants and the difference that vaccinations may have in terms of efficacy with that. 
Um, and that again is a really key thing to bear in mind because we're doing a lot of sequencing here in the UK, but other countries aren't doing anywhere near as much. So it's likely that there are going to be other variants in other parts of the world that we haven't yet discovered or picked up and um, because other places are not doing anywhere near the same level of monitoring. Um, and even the ones that we have picked up, for example, the South African variant, again, I reported out this week that the vaccine efficacy isn't as good, um, certainly against mild and moderate disease for some of the vaccines that we've already got, um, compared with the, the UK variant, for example, or the, the initial wild type virus. So again, that's gonna need careful monitoring and we're gonna need to adapt to that and adapt our vaccination responses um, with that and think about that really carefully in terms of what the vaccine passport actually means. Um, uh, and again, at the, the issue of equity um, of access to vaccination has come up. And again, it, you know, I'd, I'd echo other people's concerns about that um, in terms of within our own country, within our own population, but globally as well, um, especially, you know, um, restrictions on travel and things. It, it's going to unfairly impact um, certain parts of the world if, if that comes in, um, uh, as well as you know, individuals in the population who either can't be vaccinated for, for whatever reason or choose not to be um, and, and are, are perfectly outright to make that choice. Um, I realise that there's been a lot of talk about um, vaccine certification for other infectious diseases used as examples and, and in particular yellow fever vaccination as an example of something that's already used widely for, for travel. But I think um, I just wanted to highlight a few really key differences between yellow fever as an infection and something like COVID-19. Um, for example, for, uh, first of all, we know that the yellow fever um, vaccine is highly effective and one, one vaccination lasts a long, many, many years and provides um, really high level good immunity to the majority of people that have it. Um, but also not everyone is able to have the yellow fever vaccine. So older individuals, um, it's, it's generally contraindicated in because of um, a risk to them um, from vaccine side effects. Um, and also the, the type of infection is really different. It's a, it's a um, it, it's transmitted via a vector rather than person to person transmission. We don't get huge global outbreaks of yellow fever um, for that reason. Um, and so controlling outbreaks is, is much more uh, is much easier than it is with COVID-19. It doesn't have the same um, changes to its uh, uh, to it with the, with the kind of em um, emergence of variants and things. So so I, I understand why people are saying that there's there's already a vaccine certificate program that exists, but it, but it's by no means um, a similar a disease or, or infection. So I think um, I'll, I'll kind of wrap up there, but I just wanted to say that for those who are interested in a bit more about COVID vaccines and immu immunity to COVID-19, there are some really great resources produced by the British Society of Immunology available on their website. Um, and I wanted to reiterate how positive actually the story of, of vaccine development is and really encourage people if they're offered a vaccine to have it make sure you have both doses, but we need to continue the social distancing, the masks, the hand hygiene for now, um, while we learn a bit more about these vaccines. Um, and I think there's been a lot of emphasis about listening to the, the science for this. Um, and I would say with regards to vaccine passports, that the, the answer from science at the moment is just not yet. Thank you, Ruth. That is um that was really helpful and I just think extremely clear to help everyone listening to this uh, really understand where we're starting. The science has to be the foundation for any of this work. Um, there's a question in the chat that you might want to answer, which is just about clarification on what 70% efficacy means, as in, does it protect people? Does it protect 70% of people or does it protect people 70% of the time? But maybe that's something you could respond to in the chat because I'd like to um, turn now to uh, Mark, that feels like a really nice tee up to think about what we know about the effect of vaccines, um, but how really that compares to the other sort of measures that we've been looking at. So non-pharmaceutical interventions like masking or social distancing or closing businesses and just um, how we can kind of understand vaccines as a tool alongside others in, in tackling this, particularly at the moment. Let me turn to you now. Thanks, Mark. Great, thanks. Um, I've got some slides, so I'm going to share my screen and hopefully this will work. Everyone can see this? Great, okay. So I think um, Linda and Ruth have given a great introduction to um, a lot of the issues that I'm going to actually talk a bit about, but maybe fill in some of the details, especially on the um, issues that um, Ruth raised um, um, helpfully. 
Um, so focusing on the epidemiological impact of vaccination, which is what I've been asked to talk about. Actually, the first thing is, and I think this follows nicely from Ruth's talk actually, is what are we actually measuring? So there's a paper that, um, a sort of um, commentary paper from Mark Litsich and Natalie D that came out um, just a few weeks ago, pointing out that actually there, we, there are a number of outcomes that we're measuring when we talk about both efficacy from trials and impact of vaccines. And it's quite important to distinguish between them. In the trials, what we are measuring is most trials are measuring symptomatic disease. So people with COVID and COVID symptoms of varying levels of severity, sometimes it's moderate, severe, hospitalized or so forth. And then a few trials like the AstraZeneca trial has also looked for a symptomatic um, infection, which is probably harder to look for. So some cases might have been missed, but it's a very useful outcome to look for. Then when we talk about vaccine effects, actually we're thinking of a number of things which correspond to some extent to the outcomes from the trials, but not completely. So one is the efficacy of the vaccines to prevent disease. So someone does, if vaccinated, um, has a reduced risk of having symptoms of COVID, whether or not they're infected. A second is the efficacy to prevent infection. And that's, you know, does the vaccine stop someone from becoming infected at all? And to work that out, we have to take the outcomes in both symptomatic and asymptomatic disease because vaccines could well have an attenuating effect. They could cause some people who have symptomatic disease to have asymptomatic disease um, infection instead. And so you could actually see an apparent increase in asymptomatic infection simply because some of these symptomatic cases have become asymptomatic. And then a third, which you can't directly measure from the trial, is the infectiousness of the person, which is probably relevant if we talk about passports. So what's the reduction in infectiousness of that person? And so that's a combination of someone's protected from infection, so they obviously they can't infect at all, or someone's protected from disease, which means they probably have reduced infectiousness, because if they don't get disease, they probably I mean, are shedding less virus, um, although this is still an area of um, where we need to know a bit more. So it's a combination of those. And then a fourth effect we're interested in is what's the vaccine impact? And that's a mixture of what's the reduction in disease in the people who, who are getting vaccinated and then the reduction in other people because they don't transmit to what, well, um, epidemiologists call the herd or the community protection as a result of vaccination. And so we take all those different measures and we look at the trials. Here, um, here I've summarized, I hope I haven't missed any, but the, so far the trials I know of, vaccine trials that have reported phase three results. So the sort of final phase before authorization. And you can see there are a mixture of different endpoints. And actually some of these definitions of what symptomatic disease, what the case don't completely match. So the um, results are not completely comparable across trials. But I think we can still conclude a couple of things from this. First of all, I've, I mean, I've summarized them here. First of all, the endpoints are difficult to compare directly. They're not the same across trials. So um, a, um, a difference between 50 and 95% is probably a real difference. A difference between 85 and 95%, I wouldn't read too much into that. All the vaccines so far um, seem to show good to excellent protection against severe disease. Um, yeah. And the mRNA, vac mRNA vaccines in particular, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, seem to show very good protection against all disease. Um, mod from the whole spectrum from mild to severe. The other vaccines um, seem to show pretty good, uh, moderate to high levels of protection against all disease, with some exceptions. One exception is when we're starting to look at situations where there are variants which are not the, um, the antigen that's contained in the vaccine. There seems to be somewhat lower protection against mild disease. Um, Another exception is a trial of um, the um, one vaccine in Brazil um, from the Cancino vaccine, which seemed to be um, lower than what we've seen from um, other results from other vaccines, and in fact, one result from the same vaccine. Protection against infection is very uncertain. Um, I think the only vaccine where, which actually looked for that in trials is the AstraZeneca vaccine, which found some protection against asymptomatic infection, but lower than against disease. 
So, um, and there have been sort of um, studies looking at um, sort of viral loads in people who have received other vaccines, like the Pfizer vaccine, for instance. So these all suggest that there probably is some protection against infection, but it's less good than protection against disease. And then there's, there's the, um, well, um, Ruth also talked about the variants. Here again, the evidence seems to be mixed. So with the Pfizer and Bio, Bio, Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, there has been no actual efficacy, clinical efficacy data from this vaccine, but when taking post immunization serum from people vaccinated from it, it did seem to neutralize um, virus with mutations from both the UK or South African variants. I do have to stress this is antibody data. This has not been translated into clinical protection yet, but the signs seem to be hopeful. The Johnson and Johnson vaccine, and so, so far not peer reviewed, but released in a press re um, release, did show very good efficacy against severe disease for the South African variant. The Novavax vaccine, uh, also from a press release, showed differential efficacy when looking at different UK variants. In the main variant we're seeing in the UK, the vaccine efficacy held up, but in a uh, variant with further mutations, it didn't hold up so well. And of course, we probably heard the big news from the AstraZeneca vaccine, which failed to show significant efficacy against mild and moderate to moderate disease from the South African variant. But I have to stress that this was a post hoc unpowered um, sort of analysis of the main trial. So I would say these are worrying results, but I shouldn't take them as confirmation that the vaccine doesn't work against mild to moderate disease yet. We need to have larger numbers. I mean, it's probably is pretty good evidence that if there is some efficacy, it will be quite a bit less than it is against the sort of um, original strain. But um, I think it's from that data, it's too fast to say it doesn't work at all against mild and moderate disease from the South African variant. Then when we go on to efficacy, which is what we see in trials, to effectiveness, which is what we see in the real world, the main reports we've had so far from Israel, the initial report suggested that the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine seemed to be less effective in the real world. But I think, and this caused a bit of consternation, especially because this was a one dose um, sort of like result, which is sort of what most people have got in the UK. But I think there are a number of explanations. First of all, um, I think Ruth pointed out in the real world, you're vaccinating different people, you're, you know, um, you're, you, you might not vaccinate people in the ideal conditions, especially with a, a vaccine that needs to be kept in very, very sort of um, low temperatures. There could be selection bias. The people accepting vaccination might be different from those who don't. They might change their behavior. People who get the vaccine might be, um, engage in more sort of risky behavior. There could be some indirect protection because Israel has rolled out its vaccine program very fast. You could already be seeing reductions in the non-vaccinated people as a result of a that herd protection. And then um, Hunter and Brainard pointed out in a recent um, preprint that actually you need to exclude the sort of like um, more than the first four, um, 14 days. You might need to, it might actually take more time before um, you need to start measuring the um, decrease from uh, in order for, for people to zero convert. So I'd say that these results suggest there is some impact from the vaccine, but it's too early to say what. Um, and then population-wide impact. So far, we have no direct data yet, but there have been modeling results. For instance, this one from Laura Matraj and colleagues um, from, um, from Seattle, um, looking at actually what levels of vaccine efficacy and coverage you need in order to actually um, avert all symptomatic infections or hospitalization and so forth. And really pointing out that you need a vaccine with very high efficacy against both infection and disease, not just disease, plus high vaccine coverage. I think excess of 80% on both scales before you're gonna to start to see infections reducing to a very, very low level over 90%. Um, we did some work, this was work led by Frank Sandman, um, looking at the impact of different kinds of vaccines, a high efficacy vaccine, which is the blue, the scenario B, and a low efficacy vaccine, which is scenario C. And I think the take hopes from this are, first of all, that you know, even a high efficacy vaccine doesn't look like it's the final sort of end to COVID. I mean, there will continue to be COVID, there will continue to be deaths and economic losses, even with a high efficacy vaccine. 
But the flip side is even a low efficacy vaccine will have a lot of value. It will prevent many deaths. It will bring a lot of um, impact to the economy as a result of being able to avoid further sort of lockdowns. So it's both, this is not the only, this is not the fight, this is not the sort of like um, the only answer on its own to the problem, but it is, it, you know, it is going to help a lot. So I'm just going to end with some key conclusions, which I think are maybe are most relevant to past vaccine passports. I'm not going to maybe make a specific recommendation, but I think these are things we have to think of. First of all, vaccination provides good individual protection to the vaccinee against disease, particularly severe disease. So probably the um, person who gets vaccinated with any of the vaccines licensed in the UK or approved by WHO, for instance, will have their risk of severe disease tremendously reduced. Vaccination probably gives some protection against infection as well and hence onward transmission. But here it's a bit more unclear and the protection is probably less and possibly none against the variant. So I, no, I don't think it's too early to rule it out entirely. There might still be some protection against infection. So there is some risk reduction to others as well, but probably not that high. Current vaccines alone in the absence of other interventions will probably not eliminate COVID-19 and probably not even reduce its burden to what people have been calling a likely acceptable level. I mean, people are saying, you know, we can live with a level of COVID burden equivalent to maybe a bad flu season. That's the level we want to bring it to. And vaccines alone, the current vaccines we have, probably will not on their own be able to do that. It doesn't mean we'll be stuck in lockdown for the rest of our lives, but it probably means that, you know, this generation of vaccines will require a bit more than just vaccination alone. And all the COVID vaccines are not the same. It matters which vaccine you got. So that I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much, Mark. That was um, a really great um, uh, presentation, just helping us, I think, explain some of the complexities and uncertainties under the headline of the idea you might have a, you know, a vaccine which could be used to indicate you are safe or you are at lower risk. And I think just understanding where we are on that evidence and where there are differences and just how, um, how, uh, how non-binary, I suppose, vaccination is I think is really helpful um I just had there's um questions coming through in the chat do feel free to put others through in the Q&A function um one question that we've got in is whether equity and safety could be improved by discussing not just vaccine credentials but COVID health status credentials which might more broadly include COVID tests and I wonder if I might extend that a little bit further because in some countries we've seen proposals uh that aren't just looking at say um, vaccine status as the thing that might passport you or, or say something about your risk, but trying to do something a bit more granular or a bit more dynamic about risk scoring. So you could imagine incorporating demographic characteristics or exposure notifications where you've been, your sorts of jobs and things like that. And I just wondered if either of you have reflections about um, that question of if what we're trying to do is better understand risk at an individual level, what should we be looking at? Um, so I'll just leave that open. I don't know if either of you wanted to come in there. Yeah, I'm happy to, to try and answer something towards that. Um, I think uh, it's a really good point. Um, I think, uh, like I was, I was trying to allude to, each individual can have a completely different immune response to something, uh, be that infection or um, or a vaccine. And, and so with with vaccination programmes, we're going for a population effect basic, and we're, we're looking at protecting a, protecting a population um, as well as the individual that's that's um, that's protected, you know, that's vaccinated. So it, it's more than just about protecting the one individual that's vaccinated when we're looking at programmes like this, where we're trying to roll out across the whole population because um, one of the things that you'll have heard mentioned um, uh, is, is the term herd immunity and, and that refers to how many people you need who are immune to a, a, a disease um, in a population in order for that disease to stop being easily transmitted within the population and that can occur through either infection or through um, through vaccination um, and the, the more transmissible an infection the higher that level of herd immunity needs to be in order to stop um, transmission and, and, and prevent infections kind of going through so so we vaccinate um, 
a broader people and potentially people who are, are less at risk themselves in order to protect those who are more vulnerable. Um, and in terms of the detail of, of kind of assessing individual risk, um, we will know more about that as time goes on. Um, and the, the kind of probably the most detail we're going to get is from the, some of the studies that are being conducted in healthcare workers um, who have been exposed, um, obviously in much higher risk jobs than, than others who've been able to work from home. Um, so if we've had higher risks of, of being exposed to the virus, um, have had infections and are now being vaccinated. So I, I think they provide us a really um, helpful population in terms of getting a lot more detail um, and there's lots of work and studies going on within the UK to kind of um, look at the immunological responses to those, pick up um, reinfections in those individuals and um, knowing whether they've had natural infection um, previously um, and then whether or not they've been vaccinated um, and then whether or not they go on to develop subsequent infections. So I think um, and they obviously also often reflect a, a fairly broad um, cross-cut of society um, if, if we get it right in terms of sampling within the, the healthcare system. So I think, I don't know if that really answers the question, but I think it's a, there will, you know, there are studies ongoing where we will get kind of a lot more detail from those things. Maybe I'd add, it might be also worth making a distinction when we're talking about risk assessment about national policy and individual restrictions. So when we're sort of thinking about national policy, like which group should we vaccinate first? Then we're looking at, you know, that risk assessment. So certain people have the highest risk of either getting sick, having severe disease, or maybe transmitting. And so we want to vaccinate all those people first or healthcare workers first because they, we're worried about trans both either transmission or their own risk of disease. And I think in those situations, we should be looking at all these factors that we've been talking about. But then when we look at individual restrictions, like should we allow someone to, for instance, take a plane or do a certain job, then I think we have to look not purely at risk, but at the duty of care. So there's some things where we could say people have a duty of care, like before you get on a plane, you need to take a test or, you know, before you walk into a crowd, crowded room, you need to put on a mask. And that's something people can change. Other things like the job that you do, it's, I don't know if it's reasonable to say you have to change your job before you take a plane or even with vaccination. It would be different if you say, well, someone had the offer of a vaccine and refused it, but you know, didn't have any particular risk in taking it compared to someone who wasn't even eligible for a vaccine. One is, um, one you could say, um, I'm not arguing either way, but you could say one is you know, more about the duty of care. You could say you have a duty to care for other people if it's within your control and if it doesn't unduly burden you. So there might be a sort of ethical difference in between the sort of two sort of national policy and individual restriction. That's great, thank you so much. Um, had another question come in. Let's say if current vaccines alone can't eliminate COVID-19 or reduce it to acceptable levels across the whole population, does that mean vaccine passports for some of the population would also mean unacceptable levels of COVID-19? If it meant, you know, as we've seen, for example, in the uh, Greece-Israel example, if it means having a vaccine allows you to remove any other measures like quarantining or testing. I wondered if you had any thoughts about that. I suppose it's thinking about what the, uh, what it would mean to make vaccines the kind of primary thing you're looking at compared to these other public health measures that we've been that we've been focused on to date um i, I think that the, the answer which is going to be my main answer for m most of the questions is that we just don't know yet um, and time will tell um there are reasons to be concerned about using only vaccines as a um as a method for getting out of covid because of the issues that we've highlighted in terms of the things we don't know don't yet know um, and it may be that they uh, you know that over time we develop highly efficacious vaccines even in our um, vulnerable population or we vaccinate the population globally to a level where COVID-19 isn't transmitted so easily between people but, but we're a long way off that um, and uh, I think removing the other restrictions at the moment um, is not being done with with a huge amount of evidence to, to back up that that's going to be a, a definitely safe thing to do. And I, and I think our message um, would be to proceed with, with more caution than that. 
I guess I'd just like to add that, I mean, there are countries in the world that have eliminated or near eliminated COVID even without vaccines, and they're doing it without, you know, very draconian restrictions on social and economic activity. They're doing it with those restrictions at one point that have been phased out and with very good testing, follow-up, quarantine, isolation. And so I think vaccines are going to help us get to the point where, you know, uh, we might not have like New Zealand or um, Taiwan levels of um, contact tracing and um, but we you know vaccines will help us get to a point where it is feasible to use these additional tools to actually get to near elimination levels without having to have very strict restrictions but and and if that happens then I mean some of these countries have introduced things like um, you know travel corridors between countries with very low levels and that might be a sort of more sort of positive view of the future that um, countries might be able to use a combination of vaccines and testing quarantine to bring um, sort of like um, COVID numbers to very low levels, allow pretty free economic activities and travel between those countries and still have travel with other countries, but require things like tests and quarantines um, before that, um, people can travel. That, that could be one possible future we're looking at. Yeah. Thank you. Um, another question come in, which was if there's significant variation in vaccine response between vaccines and different people getting the same vaccine, would we be better off looking at antibodies than say a vaccine certificate? And I'm not quite sure where we are in terms of antibody tests capturing everything you would need to, to understand, to understand, but perhaps I don't know whether Ruth, you could kind of um, outline where whether that would be feasible or kind of where we are in terms of understanding commercial antibody tests as linked to immunity? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, so I think the first thing to say is that it's possible to produce antibodies to a virus, uh, autoimmune infection, and, and yet not be fully protected from getting infected by that same thing again. And in particular with natural infection, um, there are huge numbers of parts of that the virus that our body will mount an immune response to um, and generally we think that probably vaccination um, it offers us a better chance of being protected than a natu than natural infection and um, because we're targeting the, the immune response against um, the spike protein which the, the virus needs in order to invade cells rather than getting a more um, broad response that you might do from natural infection. The flip side to that is if the virus mutates um, uh, in key parts of that spike protein, then it may be better to have a broad um, immune response in terms of protection from infection than just having something targeted against the, the spike protein. So, um, but there are also, you know, the, the breadth of response to the spike protein is, is also wide from, from vaccination. There are there are lots of points that you'll make an antibody response to. Um, and again, the difference um, that I was, I was talking about earlier in terms of the, the, the level of antibody response and the quality of antibody response varies between people. So, and, the, and those are more difficult things to measure. Um, and and the, other, um, the other key thing is that, that yes, we can, we can detect antibody responses. We know that they go up after infection and the more severe the infection, then the, the higher they generally tend to be. Um, and then they wane over time. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that our, that we're no, no longer protected because what we have is uh, the key memory cells and uh, memory B cells which make uh, antibodies and um, memory T cells um, which are there to be activated again if we come across the same infection again um, and those are much harder to measure in terms of that that they're not available on the kind of commercial assay platforms that we have um, but they may be really important in terms of being correlates of protection. Um, and at the moment, you know, they're, they're a research test rather than a, a commercially available test. So, so yes, antibodies we think are important and we, we know that there's an association between higher antibody, particularly uh, neutralizing antibodies um, and uh, protection from disease. Um, but it, it, it isn't as simple as just having a, a positive antibody test means that you're protected. Thanks, Ruth. That's really that's a really helpful clarification. Um, bit of a shame, but <laughs> really important to know. Um, I just wanted to, to squeeze in one last question. We're, we are running out of time. Um, looking, you know, we've been focusing on on these proposals around vaccine passports or health status apps, and it strikes me that what they are trying to do at heart is make sense of an individual risk, an individual, an, an approach to understanding an individual's risk or risk score. Um, either COVID to themselves or, or them to other people. 
And I just wondered if you had any closing reflections about what that would mean compared to a public health strategy or in the midst of a public health strategy where some of what we're trying to achieve is about herd immunity or it's about population level responses and having a tool that focuses on the individual rather than the collective, you know, is that is that helpful to have in the arsenal alongside that? Might that cut across? I just wondered if you had any closing reflections about, about that, the kind of public versus individual approach to how we manage, um, you know, COVID, which is probably going to be around in some form or another for a long time. I think that's, that's a good question. The two one uh, completely can't be completely separated because the public health impact of anything will depend on individual responses to any policy and individual behavior change. So all of us, what the decisions we make are part of what will happen on a public health level. But I think it does raise important questions as to, well, um, you, you know, we, we, in, in any policy, we have to consider not just um, individual risk, but we have to consider wider questions about, okay, um, well, the, 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 the sort of impact in terms of equity, what's the impact on different parts of a population, including those who have greater or lesser capacity to respond to certain um, policies or might have a, the policy might have a greater or lesser effect on them. And then also, I mean, what, what's the so, sort of the, 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 the wider sort of population um, impact of someone's individual behavior, not just on themselves, but on other people and, and, and actually on, in the, on a community level, what happens if um, a, a, a group of people decide we, we, we want to do this to protect the community. Um, so I think you can't detach the two, but yeah, they, 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 they are important considerations we have to think about on a, on a public health level. That's brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, thank you both for your reflections. Um, and thank you to Linda as well, who had to, had to go to another event to launch something else. But um, I really appreciate you taking the time um, in the midst of everything else that's going on. I also want to just thank attendees for joining us. Um, as, as I said, this is part of a series. We actually have another event tomorrow where we've got a number of leading ethicists who are going to help us kind of wrestle through what some of the ethical questions are or dilemmas or contradictions um, around the idea of something like a vaccine passport. So if you want to join us tomorrow, that's at one o'clock. Um, and we'll be putting this video live on our site and, and continuing work as well. I should say this runs alongside um, an international call for evidence. So if there's anybody who um, had points they think should have been made, have perspectives, we'd really love to hear from you. It can be very top line, do get in touch. And I'll leave it there. Thank you again, Mark and Ruth, and uh, take care everybody. Thanks, bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.